Welcome to Talking Industrial Automation, a podcast where you get to know the people who make modern industrial automation possible. You will get to hear from CSIA system integrators and industry partners to get a better understanding of how they help their clients solve process challenges and how they've earned success in their careers. Along the way, we will touch on system integration best practices, technology, trends, and challenges. Whether you are a manufacturer, end user, supplier, or system integrator, you will enjoy the insights these industry professionals bring to this podcast. Let's get started. Hi, my name is Lisa Richter, the host of Talking Industrial Automation, a podcast where you get to know the people who make modern industrial automation and processing possible. In today's episode, we're talking industrial automation with Brandon Ellis, who is the founder and president of Elitech. Having worked in various capacities within the industrial automation market for nearly 25 years, Brandon funneled his experience into developing Elitech's Data Commander MES Gateway Appliance and Industrial Internet of Things Appliance, which are designed to simplify secure data movement between plant floor machines and enterprise-level databases. Brandon also founded Elitech University's Training Center, where he builds workforce development programs because he is passionate about both teaching and learning from others. And if that's not enough, Brandon is also co-host of LA Tech's podcast, Industrial Automation, It Doesn't Have To. Brandon, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Lisa. Long time listener, first time caller. Right here. <laughs> that's the first time anybody said that, and I can't believe it. So nice really? one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's start at the beginning. Why did you choose a career in automation, or maybe the career chose you? Well, straight out of college, I actually started in quality assurance. So there's that. A good reason to switch to something else uh, for me. Uh, actually, to be to be honest, I, I really appreciated all the experience I gained from my QA experience. But, uh, you know, I also love that there's QA people that love QA so that they can do it and I don't. Uh, so as my career switched, uh, I happened into a, a job where uh, I met my first PLC. And um Honestly, I hated it. I hated PLCs. I hated ladder logic. I, you know, straight out of college, you know, I didn't understand what this archaic looking thing was. And so the truth is, looking back, that, you know, my teachers really didn't understand it either. At least they didn't give me a viewpoint of that. And so I just didn't understand the reason for this thing. And, and uh, you know, basically said they don't teach it in college, so it must be useless. So I guess that was my mentality. So I left PLCs behind, went into motion control, linear, you know, linear motor systems and things of that nature. It was spot on because that's all text-based programming and none of this crazy ladder logic stuff. And so it kind of hit there. But later, you know, now motion in the last decade or two, maybe, I don't know, time flies, motion began to come back into the ladder environments. So I was kind of forced to, to migrate back into it. And, and it was then that I said, you know, I want to find out what all the hype's about. and and so when I really went into it with an open mind and, and honestly, some maturity uh, that I didn't have at a younger age uh, and some good teachers and mentors, I realized that there was a definitely, definitely a place for ladder logic in, in automation and the PLC in automation. And, and so, of course, today's systems combine that with structured tech. Text and, and, and function block and all these different flavors. And, and I realized then that, you know, you really need more than one tool in the toolbox, especially when you're programming. And so uh, it, it was really, you know, once I kind of got that, uh, you know, I didn't look back. I, and nowadays, I, you, know, you know, for the last decade, I've been mentoring the younger folks to kind of try to help them gain that new perspective that it took me about a decade and a half to really, really get to. So I, I guess it wasn't so much a choice rather than a love-hate relationship early on. How do you describe to lay people what you do? No, that's a good question. I, I, was it Einstein that said, if you, you know, if you can't describe what you do for a living to a ninth grader, then you're a fraud. So uh, we should be able to keep this fairly simple, right? You know, in, in a nutshell, Elitech is, is about moving process information really from the machine level, you know, to the data servers, be it cloud-based or hosted and, and vice versa. So we, we move the little bits of information in an automated fashion between the plant floor and, and the, the IT side of things. Share the history of how Elitech began and how the company has evolved in the automation industry. Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, in, in all of my fighting various programming languages, I was always looking for tools and platforms. I really didn't want to use Ladder. And so I, I wanted to find 
other ways to make this easier. And what I didn't realize was I was kind of Mr. Miyagi myself because I was going out and learning all these new platforms, these new languages, and honestly developed quite an arsenal of programming tools, you know, for my toolbox. And and so at one point then, really 2009, when Elotech began, I struck out, it was just me, I struck out on my own. And my emphasis was to develop what we refer to as black box solutions to uh, really, really link uh, desperate systems that wouldn't normally talk with each other. Now, now that was primarily on the OT side, the operational technology plant floor side. So, you know, getting a PLC to talk to a CNC nowadays, that's, you know, not as far fetched, but this was 20 years ago. And so uh, has it been 20 years ago, 2009? Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a minute. And so, you know, robots to PCs and things of that nature. And so that's what I was doing. And, you know, each each of that, you know, they work well enough on their own, but they didn't communicate well. And so that's what I was trying to do was was I started kind of pulling that together and having all those languages kind of helped me get into that. And, and but but I, of course, I stayed far, far away as most controls engineers even today. Some stay far, far away from the IT side of things. It's just scary, scary stuff, kind of like ladder logic was out of college. And so. But I was encouraged and kind of forced there by some some customer relationships, and and I got into what's called SCADA systems. And so SCADA, of course, is an acronym. We we, we get into acronyms a lot on our podcast. Um, so SCADA, is Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. And so I started the SCADA stuff, and and it was going well. But then basically, almost ended my OT career because support was just nightmarish because. We would put these systems in. I would I would validate them. I would check the box. I would invoice the job. You know, it was it was done. And about three to four weeks later, I would get a call saying the system's down. It's no longer running. Come here right away. And I'd have to drop what I was doing and, and go over there. And it would happen about every about once a month. And you know, as most integrators probably know, the end user pretty much always asks for a year of free support. So you're supposed to include that support. So this was getting expensive. The key is to try to not have to support it. You know, you do your job right. You don't have that support. But it was going and going and going. And in almost every case, the call was, the reason was because there was a updated firewall or they, they up, updated the virus engine or a Windows update. Or in one situation, they uninstalled my software altogether because it didn't meet the software requirements list. And, and it, was just, it was just incredulous. And so I was so frustrated with that. And, and I decided there, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be an easier way than this. And so I went out to look for that way. I didn't find it. And so in 2013, I set out to do it myself. And so that led to our data commander, which is an appliance. Appliance being the key term. It's not a PC. It's an appliance. And so from the IT world, they're judged based upon their IT assets, which basically is spelled PC. They are not judged by production and how it goes. They're judged by making sure nothing gets ransomed and, and viruses don't go. And whereas production, they're judged based upon production and they could care less if they've got security credentials and things of that nature. And so I realized there's this competing philosophy. And when you get into competing philosophies, you know, things get really interesting. And so that gave way to the data commander, which could stand in that position. It was a secure, represented a secure means of transfer. And more than that, it was very easy to use, point and click. And so we empowered, that's our company's mission statement, to empower our clients and to meet them where they are. And so it helped empower them to be able to, once we trained them, to kind of take off. And it really became a partnership and, and a whole lot of fun again at that point. But up to that point, wow, it was it was a lot. And so, um, you know, in two thousand. We, we released the Data Commander in 2014, and then in 2019, it's big brother, our IOTA, which stands for Industrial Internet of Things Appliance, which you mentioned earlier. And so we've kind of not looked back from there. You know, we, we it's, and honestly, it's been really amazing to watch what some of our clients have accomplished and, and, and honestly, what they've been able to do for less cost than they imagined. So that, those are the kind of things that make me feel like I've done a good thing. I'm still stuck on the fact that you started a business in 2009. I yeah. mean, that was like right at like the whole world was blowing up. Remember that big recession we had in 2008? You know, so. it was interesting. It was the recession that caused me to do that. Uh, the company I was with at the time was was there was talks of layoffs, and I was like, you know, I really don't like what I'm, <laughs> I, you know, fine company, but I really don't like what I'm doing. And who knew? I mean, who knew it was going to go to that level? But 
I decided I would go ahead and self-sacrifice to save some other jobs and, and go after this this thing I've been wanting to do. And so it kind of spurred me to do it. But now I've, we, we, we made it through the 2009, 2010 downturn, and now we've made it through a pandemic. And uh, hopefully, you know, they say bad things come in threes, but hopefully there was one before 2009 that I missed. And I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Do you specialize in any industry, product, or discipline? Well, you know, globally, we we like to say that we've been we we've been become known as the iPhone of MES data movement. And so, again, empowering our clients, you know, to uh, really reach and transfer data between their OT systems and their upstairs uh, ERP and 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 database systems, and and of course back down to the OT side. So. But, you know, those discussions nowadays have moved more towards cybersecurity than anything. But that's a podcast altogether, right? Absolutely. What would you say is the smartest decision your company has made recently? Smartest decision. You know, the the um, we, we've always, I guess, I guess I would say it would be tough. I'm going to call it focusing on external partnerships. And, and let, let me let me tell you what I mean about that. You know, we've always we've always worked well with the PLC manufacturers that we we talk to. We talk natively to to the PLCs, which means that, you know, we're it doesn't know we're not their own language. Uh, and so we have to work closely with PLC manufacturers to make that happen. And, and then on the database side, the ERP side, you know, with those, uh, the database manufacturers, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, those folks. But but recently, we, we've made a move to team up with two, two kind of complementary but different types of, of companies. One of those is this really software companies that, that create, some in particular that create uh, What's called computerized maintenance management systems or CMMS software, and and that's your maintenance software. It's kind of the ERP for the maintenance department. Um, and then the second thing is there's a there's a huge marketing push, and I'm not big on marketing, but uh, as, unless it's unless it's legit, right, from an engineering standpoint. Uh, but a market that IoT, of course, we, Lisa, you got to agree, IoT is probably one of the most over marketed term terms ever, right? Um, but uh, you know, condition monitoring and, and predictive predictive maintenance uh, is is the current big ticket Google search item, I guess. And so uh, there are companies that make these really cool devices, though, that will monitor vibration, temperature, humidity, you know, the whole environmental type stuff. And they can do what we refer to as the EKG method, uh, which we stick the sensors on different things, bearings, robots, you know, gearboxes, those kind of things, chillers. And, and they kind of give a picture of what's going on. And that picture is across time. And so we actually talked about this in one of our podcasts about, I mentioned that there used to be a commercial, I'm sorry, I don't remember the company, but it was about, it, the guy was, a, the character was a credit monitor. And so he, he, he said, you know, somebody's taking your identity and the, the person in the commercial says, well, what are you going to do about it? He says, nothing, I'm just a monitor. <laughs> and so it, it seemed like condition monitoring was just that. And so by being able to bridge the gap between the sensors that tell us there's something, and then of course with the IOTA being edge-based with with edge-based database capabilities, we can establish an even longer trend plot and and do the the AI and that's brand new. So there's nothing we're selling yet, but but the artificial intelligence, the machine learning part is what we're, we're working on now. But ultimately, to have that connect with these MMS softwares so that the sensor can automatically not just tell you about it, that something's going wrong, but go ahead and create a work request. Go ahead and then the CMMS software can go ahead and order parts, and those kind of things, schedule the resources automatically and just have it done. And so um, that that's one of the, I guess that that's one of the smart decisions we've made is to kind of start branching out into that kind of stuff. What would you say is unique about how you approach a project? How we approach a project? Well, you know, uh, this goes against, I tell my engineers, don't be engineers. And, and my wife would say, basically, don't be male either, because I tell them to listen first and advocate second. And so Engineers specifically, uh, and probably men as well on, on, the, on the whole, uh, we tend to talk more than we listen. And so, we, you know, we've been doing this for, for quite a long time, uh, you know, what about six years, I guess. Yeah, six, seven years. Uh, and so we've seen a lot and it's very easy and I'm guilty of this as well. For someone to come and tell me what they want to accomplish. This is my goal. And before they finish their initial sentence, I've already decided what they need. This is the solution you've got. This is the problems you're going to encounter and those kind of things. But I, I urge that, and, and the fact is, that's totally 
nearly 100% false because everybody's situation is different and their their processes are different, their data needs are different, their their hesitancies are different and fears. And so we try to listen and and then advocate. But the other thing is we 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 do a what then. I teach them to do a what then analysis. So uh, it, for example, if a customer comes and says, you know, we our goal is to pull process data, that's machine data, uh, you know, just you know, the kind of the easy stuff to pull the, the machine states and, and put them in a database. Well, the next question should be, okay, what then? And and it helps them because a lot of times they haven't thought that through because just slamming a lot of data into a database server is, it's like a spreadsheet full of numbers and, and somebody hands it to you and there's thousands of things there and, and you've got to figure out what it means. Uh, so, you know, and sometimes more is just more. You want quality data. And so, the what then helps us really get to the end, really kind of, you know, pull, pull the layers off the onion until we help them really help us steer into what they need. And then at that point, you know, it's about getting it done. But, the, you know, that, that early part of the project um, is, is the most key part. I had a boss who used to say, God gave you two ears and one mouth. <laughs> I think about that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I probably should think about that more. But, uh, you know, it, 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 I just it, I feel badly, though, because a lot of times folks are are, are kind of sold a bill of goods. And, and, and if you don't ask those questions, you're, you're probably guilty of doing the same thing. Are you interested in the latest products and services for system integration? Maybe you buy them. Maybe you sell them. Either way, CSIA has you covered. We're launching two new member benefits for system integrators and industry partners to really shine this year. The first is Innovation for Integration, a new semi-annual EPUB for CSIA members to share the industry's newest offerings at a glance. The second new member benefit will get CSIA members in front of the trade press. It's a quarterly news release letting editors know your unique value proposition or special sauce. Of course, these are in addition to the many other membership benefits you unlock when you join. Now is the perfect time to sign up because we've put together a special bundle of benefits for first-timers, including mid-year discounts. Learn more at www.controlsys.org backslash shine. What are you waiting for? Your future is so bright, you got to wear shades. Yikes, so bright, it's got to be What challenges are your customers facing right now? Marketing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize in advance. Uh, it, uh, I would say that the thing I see the most, and this is kind of a hot button for me, is, is salesy top unrealistic marketing that's especially in the IoT industry, and this has been going on for quite a quite a quite a few years. Um, especially with companies with these huge, huge, huge oversized marketing budgets, they kind of come up with stuff, and 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 even if it's somewhat realistic, it, it can kind of paint a largely incomplete picture. You know, a lot of a lot of, and I'm not bad mouthing our competition, but a lot of we try not to do this. A lot of our IoT vendors, uh, you know, they, they begin selling these beautifully marketed systems and they all start with a wonderful, nice dashboard and it just looks fantastic. And, and the term I, I use is it, it, a lot of times customers, it causes them to hear what they want to hear and see what they want to see. And, and unfortunately, it, it, a lot of times it fails to measure up. And, and, and so, you know, they the main thing they hand wave, in my opinion, is the need for easy connectivity across the plant floor. If you can't collect the data, you can't have a dashboard that's that nice. It just you've got to have you got to have the stuff to, to to show. And then, of course, there's the old saying that you probably heard garbage in, garbage out. And so if the data is not quality data, then what, what are we talking about here? Why are we spending the money? And so, you know, it really bothers me. When, you know, they fail to mention that, uh, you know, this system is going to require a multi-million PLC dollar or PLC uh, controller update. So you, all your older legacy systems are going to be after to be replaced. And we didn't figure that into our budget. That's your problem. And, or, or, you know, or, or they fail to mention that it violates basically every IT cybersecurity, uh, you know, thing that's going, you know, that's in the plant. And, and you know, they do some cellular-based system that bypasses the mean old IT folks in there you know, they're the problem kind of thing. And, and the fact is, you know, it's kind of all fun and games until, 
the budget spent and IT shuts it down. You know, where, where have you been? Where have you come from and where are you going? And so all the sales fodder, that, that's, that, that's really what, what bugs me. Uh, and, and I think a lot of our customers are facing that now because four or five years ago, there was a huge wave of IoT. We got into it. We were kind of the leading, some of the among the leaders. Uh, but but then the big boys got their marketing budgets and their stuff and their solutions, and they all wanted you know their percentage of the the estimated billion dollar IoT you know landscape and that kind of stuff. And, and a lot of a lot of really bad products were created, or not so bad. They were just incomplete because they they missed the the basics of you've got to be able to. Your whoever you're selling this to has to be able to make it work. Number one and number two, they they don't need to have all these hidden costs. Nobody likes hidden costs, and so again, that bill of goods kind of concept is is what I'm seeing, and it bruised a lot of people, I guess. And so a lot of management's kind of kind of hesitant about going down that road again. What kinds of trends and challenges are you seeing in industrial automation right now? Well, I, I think we we've, we've got this labor shortage going. And so the labor shortage, uh, if, if you're not experiencing a labor shortage out there in podcast land, congratulations, because a lot of people are not just industrial automation, go to a restaurant, you know, they're not seating right now, not because of, of COVID separation or, or capacity requirements, they're not seating because they don't have the people. And, you know, the statistic I saw was 41% of all able body workers in the United States anyway, are now reevaluating their career choice. And deciding what they want to do, and who knew that this was going to happen. So, so what that does in automation is we've been um, well. The industry has been, as Ho- uh, Jose had put in his latest post on on CSIA, thumbs up. You know, eighty seven percent, I think, of, of of the members, the integrator members, are saying things are looking up. Well, we have to because we have to do this labor creation not label reduction, not labor reclassification, which is still valid, but labor creation. We have to be able, we've got ample demand. We've got, well, we've got fantastic demand. We've got ample supply and we don't have the labor to get it out. And so honestly, I think that's part of what this semiconductor shortage is all about as well. Um, so it's not that we're run out, of, we've run out of silicone or, or whatever thing, tree or whatever produces resin that it's not with the trees are gone. It's that we we're not able to get it out efficiently, and, and I just didn't see this coming from the pandemic. So that's one thing. Uh, so if you're in automation right now, you absolutely should be busy. If you're not busy, you're, you're not trying hard. Uh, the second thing is training. Uh, I think as we talk about reclassification, uh, we just recently did a podcast on on I talked about return on investment ROI. We used to look at ROI and calculate, you know, pre COVID that you know we we look at if we install this automation or automated equipment, what's our production rates going to be and that kind of stuff. And, and labor, you know, reduction of labor does come in, into play on that. But in our recent podcast, we're talking about ROI and how you really, you really need to look at it differently because this labor shortage has kind of turned that all on its head. It's not about reduction of labor. Right now, it's just about keeping your head above water uh, because you got to make the truck. And so, Automation now has it takes the ROI on automation and it pulls it way down. I mean, like go to your local bank and take a loan if you have to, because money's cheap and it's going to pay for itself in a month, kind of way. Down. And then you've got these, but but you haven't you haven't let anybody go. If you're listening to this podcast and you're working at the factory, don't worry, you're not going to lose your job. You need a raise. We're going to reclassify you, and that comes down to training. And so, how do you retrain those folks effectively? We, you mentioned Elitech University. That's how we try to do that. And that's a regional thing for us here in East Tennessee. Uh, we work with regional manufacturers on doing that. But, uh, and I'm a proponent of, of trying to level, help people level up um, that want to. But right now it's a need because we've got these projects over here that are more advanced or these processes that are more advanced. That if you figured the ORI, even on the old basis, it just wouldn't make sense at all. Uh, reclassify the labor. Let's let's automate the easy ones and move them over, retrain them, even bump them up a little bit in their rate. And you're still going to have, you know, these great returns because you've got a process over here that now you don't have to, op- to, to automate. And you've automated this other thing down here that's going to keep on giving. And you've created labor and you're still making the trucks. And so it's a, it's a good long-term investment. And honestly, money's cheap right now. So it's a good time. But, um, you know, those are the trends that I'm seeing uh, is, is really a push for automation and a push for training.
Are your accounting systems optimized for the needs of your system integration business? Do you understand the KPIs critical to business performance? And are you prepared to proactively manage your short and long-term cash needs while minimizing your tax liabilities? Well, I've got some super exciting news to share about a brand new CSIA financial checkup program brought to you by long-term member Clayton and McCurvey, CPAs for System Integrators. Now, if you are a CSIA member, you will have access to this exclusive program designed to bring you support in four key financial areas, accounting systems, performance metrics, tax planning, and cash management. Plus, CSIA has negotiated special member pricing and packages at various price points to fit your budget. Clayton and McCurvey has helped many CSIA members over the years and is super excited to help you improve your financial performance through this program. To learn more, visit www.controlsys.org backslash check. So if we're looking at the biggest challenges facing the automation marketplace today, I mean, there's the labor shortage that you mentioned. Are there other challenges that you see in the marketplace? I think we're dumbing down our, our kids. Uh, you know, the, I talked about the condition monitoring and the AI. One, one of the primary reasons and pushes for that, and we've been approached by a couple of large, large companies to, to help with this, is the baby boomers are leaving. A lot of them are gone. And you know, I'm, I'm just south of, of, of qualifying as baby boomer. Uh, but, uh, you know, in my career, quite honestly, um, when I was there trying to learn from the baby boomers, sometimes a lot of times they would tell me, you just don't worry about it, kid. You go do your stuff over there and punch on your computer and let, we'll take care of this. But that capability to be able to see something and know or hear something and understand and, and just the way it's acting or way it feels or even the way it smells, they can say, you know, you need to change your 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 throw out bearing or you got it. You got this gearbox, is going back, you know, something like that. That experience is exiting. And we have done a very poor job, my generation, our generation, at, at, at forcing them to teach us. Now, I've had a lot of experience, so I'm lucky. And I got to work with a lot of fantastic folks that were happy to teach and to pass that knowledge down. And so that's what I try to do now. But, but we're largely, um, we've largely uh, uh, underprepared uh, the those that are below us, the generations below us that are coming into the workforce now. And so uh, the the whole condition monitoring and predictive maintenance thing is really the AI is to try to make it emulate the 30-year veteran so that the young person can, can use this app, if you will, or whatever to tell them what to do so they don't really have to understand it. And 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 while that sounds fantastic, it's a, it's a dumbing down that Scenario would be teaching someone to use a calculator so that they don't have to learn math. But if you don't have the concept of math, how innovative are you going to be? And, and, and honestly, the ones that decide to overcome that and, and learn math anyway, those will be the innovators of tomorrow. They'll be changing changing uh, the world. And so hopefully there, a lot of them are entrepreneurs and they'll go out and start new businesses and, and do some fantastic things and, and make us all look bad. What makes you optimistic about the future of the automation industry? I've been talking a lot of doom and gloom, haven't I? (laughs) That's good. Let's talk about the positive. Always extenuate the positive. That's what my mom always told me. Uh, You know, for for me, uh, being able to work with and and teach this younger generation, you know, and really watching them suddenly make, make, you know, connect the dots and and, kind of like me years ago, kind of realized that, you know, the light bulb will go off. Wow, wow, this ladder logic is horrible. And then suddenly, wait a minute, this makes a lot of sense. There's no way I could do this for structured text, you know, those kind of things. And, and then, you know, the, the possibilities begin to just roll out. And, and, and so, you know, being able to relate a few what I call old guys bit of, bits of wisdom uh, and having them get it, you know, and, and, and I'll tell you, there, there are um, a lot of smart kids out there. They're, they're much smarter than we are, but it's a different type of energy. It's a different type of, of, of push. And, and as a business owner, some of them have been very difficult for me to learn how to manage. And, uh, and then others have been just like, wow, where have you been my whole life? You know, that kind of stuff. But, but each one has, has something to contribute. And so 
I, I think, you know, again, watching in, in our podcast, my our producer, my co-host, Beth Elliott, says that I have the ability to explain things, complex things in simple ways. And I do that with a lot of metaphors. So so being able to use a mechanical metaphor to to explain to someone who's a mechanical engineering student an electrical phenomenon or an electrical thing or, or vice versa and, and having them, you know, suddenly get it. Just, wow, that makes sense. Uh, you know, that, that's really, that's really what makes me smile. And so uh, of course, teaching is, is a need. I think we need to be doing first, especially in my age group. Uh, and then, you know, we, we tend, especially with social media, we tend to put people down. We tend to be negative. We tend to do those kind of things. And, and I think, you know, the Bible says love one another. I think we need to, focus on really uh, trying to teach and our age group teach the younger ones and then the younger folks of course hopefully they're they're open why did Elotech become a member of CSA well um because Jose told me to no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, actually I did have a great conversation with him I remember you know but but honestly to teach I, I really like teaching and and we had the uh, the opportunity we were invited to speak uh, at the New Orleans uh, the last in-person scheduled in-person uh, get together. And so uh, I was going to be part of an IoT panel and was scheduled to be, be part of that meeting. Of course, it was canceled due to COVID. Uh, so we didn't have the opportunity. But before the cancellation and speaking with Jose and others at TSIA, because uh, we had kind of a, a panel, it was a panel. And so we were talking and kind of preparing, you know, it just with our experience in the industry and in IoT and, and, and those kind of things, you know, Jose especially said, you know, it, you need to join. You you need to be a partner, and and you really should anyway. Uh, but but you've got a lot to to offer our, our group, and so uh, I don't know how good of a job I've done at offering, you know, information to to the integrators and other partners in, in CSA. But uh, there's a lot of smart folks. I don't know that I can offer very much, but uh, but but I was flattered by that. And so if it was a sales tactic, he did a great job because we were we were on board and we have been uh, ever since. And so. Um, just being able to evangelize really the for me the simplified secure IoT type solutions and potentially open the door to to maybe some new integrator partners for us to work with and things of that nature and so that that's really really what it was about but I, I kind of see that more as a as a teaching kind of moment. So just for those of you for those listening who may not know who Jose is Jose is my <laughs> boss <laughs> and he is Jose Rivera he is the CEO of. Uh, CSIA. So just for context there. Doesn't everybody know who's <laughs> Actually, I think they do. And when I travel yeah. with him at trade shows or whatever, I mean, yeah. everybody knows Jose. He's a great, great guy. <laughs> Very smart guy. For sure. From a supplier perspective, how should a customer go about choosing a system integrator? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, now, how would you choose somebody to build a house for you? You know, you want to see references, right? You want to kind of see what they've done. I don't think there's anything wrong we encourage people to tell us to make us prove it. Now we're doing IoT systems, and if integrators, you know, integrators may be doing stuff that you can't really prove uh, as easily. But if there's a way, uh, an integrator should want to show their stuff, uh, prove it out. You know, we we would we would I would love I used to love and I still occasionally get invited <laughs> uh, to to go on site and and take our IoT product and just say you know let's show you what it can do. Um, tell us what you want, and we'll just wing it. And I, it might not work. And if it doesn't work, let's dig into that and the why of that. And let's learn from it. Again, that whole teaching training thing. Let's see what the situation is. Let's see what, what the horizon looks like before you've spent a dollar, you know, that, that kind of thing. And, and then, you know, hopefully with our product, uh, we, we, we let, we set it up and let it roll. And, you know, we, we can actually be moving into that in two minutes or less. And so it's just, like, wow, that's great. Let's, let's go have drinks, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's, it's, it's that kind of deal, hopefully, you know, high fives in the whole nine yards. So, but, but that's, that's kind of what I think. I think if you can ask them to prove it or at least show you some of the things that they've done before. And of course, they're CSIA. I mean, you know, those, those, those members are, look, it's, it's an investment. Uh, CSIA is not for the faint of heart. Uh, they expect everybody to, to, uh, everybody does benefit a lot. We benefit benefited a, hu- a huge amount from the CSIA. We're huge fans and and totally worth the, the the membership fees and things of that nature. If someone else is in this group, it's because they mean to be and uh, and they probably are worthy. So that alone is quite a reference. But yeah, that that's what I would do is is again, if if you wouldn't 
if you would want somebody to add an addition onto your house, how would you ask them to, to, to deal with it? Do the same thing with, with the systems integrator, machine builder, whatever. Hi, my name is Barry Anderson, and I'm a director at Latsa Learning Services. If there's one thing I've learned over my 30 plus years of estimating, focusing mainly on industrial electrical and systems integration, managing estimation teams, and developing estimation systems and procedures, it's this. A small investment in training can help to avert major losses. That's why it's so important for you to have people on your team who understand the art, science and discipline of estimating projects and delivering proposals. In conjunction with the CSIA and based on my decades of experience, I developed an online self-paced course targeted for systems integrators. Along with providing guides for processes and some templates to help formulate your own practices, the course contains a realistic scenario where you bid to a soda manufacturing company based across multiple locations with both bottling line upgrades and complete greenfield plant installations. Once you've successfully completed the quizzes at the end of each module, you'll walk away with a certificate of accomplishment. You can learn more about this course at www.controlsys.org backslash win dash more. Let me help you to win more by bidding less. So a couple times you've name dropped your podcast throughout our I discussion. I haven't name dropped it. <laughs> I didn't say the name one time. You've, I just well, okay. <laughs> you've mentioned it. You've slipped it into the conversation. Let's put it that way. And it's totally fine. I want to hear about it. Tell me about your inspiration for starting it. What kind of topics and audience um, audience you're you're trying to reach and that kind of good stuff. Well, the name of our podcast is Industrial Automation. It doesn't have to. And I'm actually uh, in our podcasting studio now. We're recording this from our podcasting studio uh, while we're doing this interview. And coincidentally, the co-host and our producer, Beth Elliott, is here with me as well. And so, Beth, you want to say quick hello? Even though Hello, everybody. So that's Beth. And so <laughs> she's making sure I don't mess this interview up. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, she she is, uh, is our producer. She does a fantastic job. And again, she's our marketing manager. So why did we start the podcast? Quite honestly, Beth is, is, is our marketing manager. And so, as you know, what do you need for marketing? For websites, for blogs, you need content, right? I am horrible at sitting down and typing anything. Writing, she couldn't read it if I did. Um, and so, she and I, uh, first couple of years that she was here, we kind of, she would, would gently remind me that she needs content. She needs what's in my head to go, you know, to be put into uh, not just the websites, but social media, also copy, printed copy, things of that nature. And it was such a struggle for her, I know, and I apologized a lot. And so one day I just walked into her office and said, you know what? I can talk a lot easier than I can write, type, and do all this other stuff. So why don't we start a podcast and, and we'll just be talking about all these things that because every time she said, every, I should just record you. Every time you come in and somebody mentions something, you've got an experience or, or a thing that happened or something like that. And so that's how it kind of started. She came up with the title, which I loved, which was Industrial Automation Doesn't Have To. And we insert the, kind of the anonym of what we're going to be talking about. So as an example, we we're talking about, well, I'll let you guess. It was Industrial Automation it Doesn't Have To Be Colonial Pipeline. And so we're, we're probably talking about, you know, cybersecurity. Uh, and and that's the way we kind of when we weren't throwing I'm, we're not throwing any kind of shade at Colonial you know they had a had a real problem there but but it's a good thing to learn from for the rest of us if it happened if it happened to them and they're they're fantastic systems and you know it can happen to a, a lot of folks especially in, in the industrial segment so that's really what it's about so it's about it's not so much about selling uh, it's about learning and and teaching from experience and we also always challenge our listeners to to hit us back in one way or another with, with, a, with a problem that they're facing. And then if we don't know the answer, again, it's kind of like me going on site and the IOTA doesn't work. You know, that's just an opportunity to delve in and see why it's not working and those kind of things. And so um, to, to be able to do that uh, in the podcast, you know, hit us with, with what you're, you know, you're dealing with. And if I've got any experience, I'll be happy to, to share. And we've talked for everything from you know, uh, mainly automation in the industrial world, but we've also even gotten to RPAs. Uh, what is that? Robotic process automation. Um, and and that has nothing to do with a robot, but it has everything to do with automation. And as we're dealing with this labor shortage and things of that nature, you know, the office is a place where, remember, there's a labor shortage across the board. So we get into those kind of topics. 
Do you mostly, um, is it you talking or do you have guests on? What's the format? We have guests um, uh, when we can. We, we uh, occasionally um, have guests. Uh, I like to have guests, but we like to have a guest that, that really ties to the topic. And so, uh, for example, we, um, and it, you know, a lot of times those are partners that we know anyway. So uh, as a company, we partner with, with a company called Datalogic, and, and Datalogic does a lot of barcode scanning systems and vision systems, but they do safety, safety systems. And, and so one of their representatives have, that we work with, our, our rep, I guess you would say, uh, is a, a long, long time safety guy. And so I'm IoT. Remember, <laughs> not safety. And so we had him on uh, specifically to talk about just to bear his knowledge uh, about safety and safety requirements, especially safety uh, in the U.S. versus safety in the in the, in the EU and, and you know overseas and things of that nature. And so it's a very interesting podcast for me. But I learned a lot, uh, and we think that's beneficial. It's beneficial to to integrators and machine builders alike, but also end users. And, uh, you know, if they're trying to decide, because in the United States, we learned a term called onus. And onus is a lawyer term that I never, I wasn't familiar with. But basically, it says, basically, who's responsible? And in the United States, the responsibility of safety classification in the plant uh, falls upon the plant. But in the EU, it falls upon the integrator of the machine building. And so there's some differences like that that, that I, I, you know, questions I would have never asked that we think is beneficial. So it's not all just IoT. It's, it's all things industrial automation, because again, I started as an integrator hating PLCs, but ultimately falling in love with them. And, and we, we've done quite a few systems. So, so if somebody wants do. to listen to the podcast, how do they find it? Well, um, I think the correct answer to that is basically whatever podcast uh, app that you use, just search for Elitech, E-L-L-I-T-E-K, and uh, we will pop, pop up in that regard. Or Elitech.com is our website. And on the main page, Beth has that beautifully done. You scroll to the bottom, right above our mission statement, you can see our podcast. So uh, if you if you hit the mission statement, you've gone too far. All right. So we're going to switch topics completely now. And I want to ask you about parallel universes. So I'm reading a book. Um, it's a fiction book, but they're really exploring this to- topic of quantum physics and the idea that we could be living... Uh, an exponential number of lives in different universes, right? So I'm going to ask you if there is another Brandon in another universe and you get to choose what he's doing, what is he doing career wise? (laughs) Well, first of all, I'm going to say, wow, quantum (laughs) physics. Um, I'm sure that he's in marketing. He's that's what he is. He's a marketing person. No, actually it's Judy Picot. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's a pretty popular, um, novelist and she tends to take one topic and then each character in the novel will have a different perspective on that topic. So sometimes it's a very controversial topic. Sometimes it's like this, a really, you know, um, quantum physics so it's a, me- a meeting topic but it's very i mean it's 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 a light read <laughs> please well i wasn't talking first. about the author i was saying that <laughs> the other brandon in the parallel universe oh sure oh i marketing. see <laughs> yeah i'm kidding of course I, I don't, um, uh, and i have a lot of respect a lot of respect for for marketing so beth's beth's giving me the stink eye over here you are too i can see you you can't see us <laughs> luckily um no I, honestly I'm, I'm sure it would be to be a teacher. I really enjoy teaching. And, and, and when I almost left it, my, my freshman year in college, University of Tennessee, Tennessee Vols, this is our year. Just kidding. Um, the, uh, no, I went to the University of Tennessee here in Knoxville in engineering and, and almost switched, switched majors to physics uh, because I wanted to be a physics teacher. Then I found I had to take organic chemistry and I was just like, nope, let's stick with electrical engineering. And so uh, stay, stay away from that chemistry stuff. And, uh, but, but I, I really have come to enjoy teaching and I get to scratch that itch now in, in my career. And I'm happy about that. So, uh, but that, that's probably what I would have done in teaching or I don't know. And I'm, I'm a business guy too. So I enjoy that. I don't, I don't know. Would I, would I have failed out of college if I'd majored in business? Probably. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I learned a lot of that through, through mentoring uh, people that mentor me. And so, uh, but I, I would say probably teacher. So if we are going to go back to that younger Brandon and you can travel back in time, what what would be the best advice you could give your younger self just getting started? Well, you know, and, and honestly, I see this. I see myself in a lot of the young kids today. So, so you know, there's, there's not necessarily anything new under the sun. Um, uh, I came out of college not as a know-it-all, 
but thinking I was supposed to be. Uh, you know, it, it's what it's what it's the age old thing we call pride. And and I would say resist your 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 push to be a, the know it all, and and really try to uh, you know I, I guess try to try to try not to be intimidated by those that know more than you and and embrace that uh be approachable uh and approach i said earlier my generation didn't do a good job approaching the baby boomers to say please share with me uh i, I you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say i know more than you because if you do that at any age you're done so be approachable um I, I fought a lot of battles that didn't need to be fought and uh and my career probably would have been easier and probably every manager and boss that I've ever had, if they're hearing this, they're like, they're shaking their heads upside, up and down. Uh, you know, just I, I could have been more approachable and more open minded and, and less about being intimidated about not knowing the answer. Well, that's it for today's episode of Talking Industrial Automation. If you are interested in learning more about Brandon Ellis or LA Tech, you can find them on the Industrial Automation Exchange at www.csiaexchange.com. Thanks for listening and thank you, Brandon, for joining us today. Thanks, Lisa. You're the best. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also help others find us by leaving a five-star review and sharing your favorite episodes with colleagues. Thanks for listening to the Talking Industrial Automation Podcast. Thanks also to bensound.com and Wistia for the music bumpers. Until next time.